you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney prior to or during any question. If you can't afford one, the court will appoint one for you. Do you understand your rights? And the wolf is at your door. You're running so that's for sure. This episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast may contain descriptions of acts of violence or that of a sexual nature. It should be for people that are 18 years or older. Heed my warning, people. I do not get the facts of these cases off of the Internet or for some television show. The facts I'm retelling you were presented to me by the victims of the crimes or the perpetrators who committed the crimes against the victims. My descriptions of the crime scenes, what I saw with my own two eyes. If you're going to get offended, please turn this podcast off now. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Woody Overton. Thank you, everyone, for listening and tuning in, and liking and subscribing and leaving us reviews. I appreciate it. You're helping us grow. Patreon members and convicts, thank you for subscribing. Hope you're enjoying all your bonus episodes and the case files that we're putting up and all that extra that we try to give you along with your weekly early drop of each episode that is commercial free and unedited uh, um, which I think is probably some of the funniest parts right but anyway thank you all so much I appreciate you today I'm going to be doing a bit of a weird episode Um, it's weird if you're a regular citizen that doesn't know what I'm about to tell you about and but it's real life real crime okay so let's just go back and it's going to be multiple stories in one I think and we'll go back to, oh, God. Let's start with one when I was in uniform patrol, okay? And it used to be crack. Crack was everything. When I was hunting at night and they called me the wolf, and we were always down hunting the, the guy, people that would come into these hoods to buy the crack. And we were chasing dope dealers and shit like that on foot, vehicle pursuits, whatever. After a while... It was just a day at the office. Um, but, you know, still hunting, the hunting of men, and it was awesome. But I was so freaking happy when we made the first meth bust in Livingston Parish. And it was John T. Wilkerson and I. It was a Sunday night, and we were going down, oh, God, I think it's George White Road in Holden, Louisiana. We were cutting through. Um, not really looking to get into any kind of trouble or whatever, but just kind of skating through the areas that were sometimes a little bit questionable for drug use and stuff like that. We, I remember we were hunting. We were hunting men. And it's like 4 o'clock in the morning. And I probably have told this story before, maybe on a Patreon episode. But we come around and turn on George White and the, off in the woods on the right, there was a fire, a, a, like a big campfire, and there were some people around it. And John T. pulls up. He says, "He says 361. I think his number was 337. 337, 361. You see what I see? I say, yep. And it's 4 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday night. You know, we need to check their temperature. And also, this this there was no houses. This was like rural shit. There was no houses or anything like that. Um 
So it's just highly suspicious. You're in this really rural area off this road that nobody goes down, and you got a fire going that can be seen from the road. When John T pulls in, I pull in behind him. As soon as he gets out, it's like cockroaches when the lights turn on. Motherfuckers took the fuck off. (laughs) So foot pursuit. Well, not that much of a foot pursuit when you're in the woods, okay? This was a lot. It was all trees, and it's all woods behind it, and they haul ass, and they take off running. I think it was like four of them. They take off running, and we pursued for a little bit, but the immediately what I was hit by was the sense of a smell of ammonia, okay? Um, very, very, very strong. I didn't know what it was at the time. I'd never fucked with meth. I'd never... Dealt, uh, never made a meth bus or certainly not a meth lab. And John T and I chased them for just a little bit. And these motherfuckers are like, like coyotes in the night, right? They were gone. And, but the, I, that, that ammonia smell was so strong. It like burned me when we were running through it. And I'm talking about my lungs. And John T was like, started coughing and we both were doing it. And then there was a, um, like a gas cloud, like a, like, it wasn't fire smoke. It was it was like but a cloud, and it was coming from over by the fire. And we go over there. Fuck, we were stupid. We didn't know. We go over there, and it's meth that is cooking off, right? And so one of the processes when they're cooking it off, they add the anhydrous ammonia, and it makes this big cloud. And that's what we were smelling. And we didn't have any training in it. We didn't know how dangerous that shit was or how sick it would make you or anything like that. But we get to looking at the containers, and there's some filters, uh, coffee filters, that have wet dope on them, um, wet meth. Okay, so during the cooking process, there's no fire, y'all. There's no heat added to it, not, not this process. There's no heat added to it. But it, what it is is a chemical reaction process, and that's what they call it, cooking it off, is the chemical reaction, and the final product is meth, all right, um, methamphetamine. Now, during this the, this process, naturally you have to have the cold pills. Uh, they have to wash those down, and the, the pseudoephedrine or whatever they get out of that, they put into the, the cooking process. They use... Uh, or they used to use lithium battery strips. Now, y'all remember this before ice came out, okay? This is way back when. Um, they would take the lithium batteries and strip them out, and it's inside there is a strip of lithium, and that motherfucker is highly explosive, and they would put it in the process. Um, I'm not going to tell you all of it, but the you hear about meth labs blowing up. That's because that somebody fucks up during the process and something touches something that shouldn't and it causes the explosion. All this shit's there. They're on the ground and I can see it by firelight and of course I have my flashlight on. Meanwhile, we're breathing ammonia. Uh, you can see all the punch packets from the pseudoephedrine pills, which at the time it was not illegal or at the time you could go to Walmart anywhere and buy as many boxes as you wanted to. You didn't have to go to the counter, sign your name, and get limited to two boxes or three boxes, whatever it is now. You could go in and buy 300 boxes if you wanted to, right? And so they all these, um, what do you call it, like bubble casing, plastics, whatever the fuck. They, you know what I'm talking about, where you have to punch your medicine out of. There's hundreds of those on the ground. A little bit of a hint, right? We're breathing ammonia. They're stripped batteries, lithium batteries stripped on the ground, and we're breathing ammonia. And there's wet dope. Uh, when it comes out, it's wet. It has to be dried out. And meanwhile, there's something that's fucking cooking off, putting up this cloud. So we back out and call. At the time, Stan Carpenter was the chief of narcotics and I'm to be honest with you, he was really the, the only narcotics officer there was. I think Vic Marler was working some in, in that capacity, um, but they didn't have a whole section dedicated to it, I can assure you. But when you uh, came to the conclusion that it's a meth lab, so we had to call Stan. Stan comes out, and it's, uh, oh, you know what I'm going to forget? There was 
porn magazines, porn magazines that were there also. Now, meanwhile, I mean, we're, we're securing this as a crime scene when Stan's coming out. We've called it in and everything else. Well, fuck, nobody knew who to call. And, but there, and nobody, we certainly didn't know it was hazardous to your health. Uh, uh, so we're kind of standing around and the fucking ammonia was really bothering me and hurt my chest. So we backed out a little bit. But I'll never forget the porn magazine. It's like jugs and uh, <laughs> different shit like that. I'm like, what the fuck's this doing out here in the middle of the night? But the long or the short, Stan had to come out and when he saw what it was, he had actually had some training in Mississippi at the, I think their state police academy or whatever, and he knew what it was. Well, the problem with it, the whole situation is nobody knew what the fuck to do with it. Now, he had been trained that it's it's a hazardous dump site now. When you get there and it shit's there, I mean, you're fucked. And so he calls the DEA out of Baton Rouge. Now, this is a, this is a hot motherfucking potato, right? The DEA sends two agents out. Now, this is hours later. They send two agents out and... They look at the scene, they're like, yes, this is definitely a meth lab. They, in turn, have to call, where they take certain things into evidence, you know, blister packs and shit like that. And, of course, they're going to try to work the case. And I'll tell you about the DEA. It never took a case from me that I didn't have an arrest in that wasn't locked dead tight. Lock, box, what's it called? Lock, stock, and barrel, right? But anyway, they came, and then they had a call cleanup company, and these fuckers came out of, like, Memphis or somewhere and came out, and they they get out. They got hazmat suits on. Them. This is the next day. They got hazmat suits and shit on. They're like, you know, y'all were out in this? And, and you know, my lungs are burning and stuff. And I'm like, yeah. Um, and they even took you in the pornography into evidence. So first meth lab ever done was right there. Now, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. That was a prelude. Then we started seeing it all the time, all right? And then um, and started working confidential informants, and they would tell me who was cooking. And back then, it was a real big, hard deal. There it wasn't an internet that you could go look up how to cook meth. They had one guy that would come in, and his name kept coming up over and over again. I'm not going to say it. But he would come in, and he was a professional meth cook, and he would charge the people, whoever got him to come in, he would charge them $2,000 and half the dope from the cook. He would come in and teach them each one of the steps, all the ingredients needed, each one of the steps, and they would cook off the dope in a clandestine location, naturally. And then, hey, look, you, I know some people do it, but you want you to fucking cook this shit inside. When they gas that stuff off, it'll kill you. A couple of breaths, I came to find out later on, a couple of breaths at just the right moment in the cook-off process will fucking drop you dead, okay? So long and short, this guy would come in, make his two grand, get his half of the dope, however much it was, and I can assure you he wasn't cooking a small amount, and he would leave. But meanwhile, he's teaching our locals how to cook the dope. Mm. Not always the sharpest fucking tool in the shed, right? The ones who did it, some of them got blown the fuck up. And to me, the best lab, meth lab is the one you went to and the motherfuckers burn up and people have burned up and you never have to mess with it, right? Once I found out how poisonous it was and how dangerous it was. And look, meth, so addictive. It makes crack cocaine look like M&Ms. And I used to joke, after meth started, I used to joke and say, well, fuck the crack dealers gonna have to get on welfare now, right? Because mess shutting their fucking ass down, um, and then it start growing, 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 and it just became an epidemic. The school that I ended up going to for meth, as it became the epidemic, they taught me in the school. The one thing I'll never forget is that two things. The instructor said he said there's two things you're gonna find at every meth cook site pornography and firearms he said firearms because they're so fucking paranoid and you know they stay up for so long um the meth is made from all these household chemicals and shit and it's so bad for you that when 
you hear people tweaking and they have scabs and their teeth rot out and shit like that. But the scabs on their arms is where they're high or they're tweaking. They keep picking the scabs where the, the scabs are. That's the body. Their body is trying to process out the poison that's inside the meth. So it pushes it out the pores in their skin and it makes them pick because it itches. And that's where you get the mess sores all over your body. And the teeth rod, well, fuck, that's a self-explanatory, right? But um, the firearm deal, now, by this time, we've done numerous, 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 that last, probably 100. We went from the first one to two a week to two a day. And it was just all the fucking time because it's so addictive. And the difference between a meth head and a crackhead Back in the hood, you run down a crackhead uh, or wherever you run down a crackhead at, they will always throw the crack. Every single time. You'll never catch them with the crack on them because they're going to throw it before you tackle them. Meth head, every single one of them would rather you take the chance of you catching them and finding the meth on them than to throw it away. They didn't want to lose their meth. That's how addictive it was. And there was there was one house, in, uh, right? 122 outside of Springfield, I'm not going to say the name, that we had been trying to get them for a long time. We knew they were cooking. Um, we'd been set up, watching them, stopping people that were coming out, blah, blah, blah. But finally, one night, we got lucky to stop a car coming out and away from there where they couldn't see and arrested the guy for possession of meth. He had meth. The one of got permission to search. He had meth. And, of course, we play the game, right? Hey, we know where you came from. Give us information. Help us help you. Well, fuck. He said, they are fucking cooking right now. Did you see it? Yes. Well, I saw it. It's in this trailer back behind the residence. This is where it's at. You go in the trailer. Boom. We gave it all the details, right? What do we do? Write a search warrant. Go get a judge to sign it. Well, one of the guys, probably Vic, went to get the judge to sign it while we stood by. And we were gonna hit that bitch hard and fast. As soon as the judge, as soon as the judge signed the paper, we weren't waiting on somebody to get back from a judge's house. We were going in because we want that meth lab. We've been after these fuckers forever. Hey y'all, you hear that sound? Man, it makes me smile. It's the sound of another sale on Shopify. The all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shop 5 gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online, in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. Scaling your business is a journey of endless possibility. Believe me, I started out in Real Life Real Crime selling the t-shirts y'all and the hats and stuff like that but today we're selling everything from car kits to stickers to mugs to backpacks to towels whatever you, you want real life or crime we're selling we're selling it through shopify because they handle everything but we're not stopping there because success is a million milestones on the forever evolving path i love how shopify has the tools and resources that make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. The main thing for me, when we were doing it by ourselves in the beginning, we had to handle all the sales, the money, the returns, the orders, everything like that. They take it off your plate, people. If you have a small business or a business, big business, and just let these people handle it, it's what they do. It, it takes that time and effort, and you can spend it on something else like telling a better podcast, right? Like mine, Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale. Reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Synchronize your online and in-person sales. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. Y'all, I love to watch my numbers, right? More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility Powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash R-L-R-C, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. 
Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash R-L-R-C right now. Shopify.com slash R-L-R-C. Judge signs it. I can't remember if I was there. But the judge, I'm talking about cop wise, but the judge signs the paper. We roll in. These fuckers are standing in the front yard. There's three of them. And they started to run. Naturally, we were ahead of them. We got them, tackle them, get them down, and get them up, handcuff them. For officer safety, right? We have a search warrant for the property and and the buildings. Uh, They are there. Due to our experience and training on firearms, we knew there would be firearms on the scene. Um, and pornography, right? The, uh, but tackle him down, and I'll never forget the one guy, the um, the get him up, stand him up, I'm pat frisking him after ha- I got him handcuffed and fucking in his front shirt pocket, a big old bag of meth. I'm, I'm talking about like two ounces or something, a lot. And I'm like, motherfucker, why didn't you throw it? He's like, fuck that. I'm not throwing away two ounces of meth, right? Because it's so addictive. But we end up working the scene, going into that trailer. Uh, um, meth lab was cooking off. Boom, definitely. Guess what was there? Pornography like you've never seen. Now, remember, y'all, this is before the internet is prevalent. The the this is what if you wanted pornography, you had to go into your local gas station, wait for somebody to leave. Uh, uh, or wait for the people to leave and then go up to the counter and say, oh, can I have the penthouse for them or whatever, right? I'm not saying that I've done this, people. I'm just telling you how it works. <laughs> but porn magazines everywhere. And now, look, they weren't spending money on a high-dollar high magazine like a penthouse anyway. It was always some nasty bullshit. But porn magazines everywhere. Of course, we process the scene, get, finally get these assholes into jail. Um, and part of the evidence, oh, three pistols and a solid-off shotgun. The solid-off shotgun was a federal charge um, because it was in it solid-off. You, know, you can't have that Project Exile. So that was a really good charge. The other guns, especially the asshole that had the two ounces on him, he had a pistol, and that's illegal carrying a firearm with a CVS. Another good felony charge, but it's not a federal charge. So great bus. Everything's great. Again, pornography, guns. Fast for it. Uh, now, you are only as good as your CI information, right? Your confidential informant's information when you're working dope. And I thought dope is all I ever wanted to do. I used to have so much fun working dope. I thought it's all I ever, ever wanted to do until I worked my first homicide, right? And then my life was changed forever. But back to my dope days. We work CIs like crazy, um, always trying to find out who's cooking, who's selling, who's going in to buy the pills, who's going in to buy the camp fuel. Um, one night I was off duty. I was a single dad at the time, and, and my daughter was with her mother. And I would always go to Walmart and Hammond late at night. I lived in Albany. Walmart and Hammond late at night because I like to fuck with the crowds. And I'm in that son of a bitch. And I'm having a, in a sporting goods section, and I look and I see two of our local meth heads, and they're pushing a basket. And I look in the basket; they didn't see me. I look in the basket, and it's got coffee filters, camp fuel. It's got all the makings for meth. I'm like, fuck, I'm off duty, but I called it in. Got Hammond City. Um, and I mean, we knew them, but we used to stop some of them every night. I'm talking about the cooks, but they were smart. They were smart, and this night in particular, Hammond City got the, got them in the parking lot and charged them with attempted manufacturing of meth, right? But in the car next to them was one of the bad guys we'd been after forever, and he actually had paid them to go in and do it to get all the stuff, and he was going to do the cook. He just sat there laughing when I'm out there, right? He's like... Hey, Woody, how you doing? And I'm like, oh, fuck you, motherfucker. We didn't have anything on him. He wasn't in the car with them. He wasn't in the store. He gets away, right? Till another day. Um, I was working dope, and 
this goes back to the sex and, or the pornography and the guns. Meth is a very, very, very big sex drug, okay? It, whatever dopamines and shit that releases when you have orgasms and stuff, meth does the same thing. And that's where the pornography falls in. If they're not having sex, then they're masturbating. I mean, they teach us school. It's a fact. Look it up. The So your meth heads are all about sex, period. I mean, it's like absolute. Besides staying up for however long, meth is about sex. So we were on, I was training somebody actually one night, um, field training officer. That was me. And I'm not going to say the guy's name because he still works for him. But the he's a tall guy. He had on one of the sheriff's office baseball caps. And we were way, way to fuck up and way almost by the parish line. I'm not going to say the name of the road. The, the, there should have been nobody up there, period. Okay? But I say, let's go up here because I know I got some information. They've been cooking up here. And we go up and we're going down and... What do we see when we come around a turn in this road? It's, when I say a road, I'm using that term generously. At least you see a vehicle facing us, no lights on. I tell us to light them motherfuckers up. So he turns on the spotlight, puts it on them, turn our lights on, call it in, 259, route on, such and such, with a 107B, suspicious vehicle. So <laughs> order them out, of the, or he orders them out of the car. Now I'm at the point in the FTO process where he's doing everything and I'm just reviewing. In the beginning, I had to do everything. They had to ride with him for like 12 weeks or something. In the beginning, I did everything they observed. I did everything from the radio to reports to, you know, the rest, whatever. As the FTO process went along, I had to evaluate them. And as they got to where I thought they were safe enough, I would let them begin to drive, let them take the radio, let them make the arrests, the whole nine yards. I would just observe them, and afterwards, I would tell them if I thought they did something wrong, right, or they could have done something better. This night, this guy was almost done. Um, he lights up their car. They're blinded, and he's ordered them out of the car by the loudspeaker. We're almost facing head on, right? And I'm out, out of the passenger side door, and they start, they're fumbling around. You can see them in like on the driver's side of the car fumbling around. And you can see two bodies and you can see some skin. And then they, they didn't get out of the car immediately. So he's like, get out of the car now. Get out of the car with your hands up. And finally they get out. And it's a male and a female. Both of them known to me as meth heads. The female was actually a CI of mine, and the guy was her new boyfriend. It, uh, at the time, actually, he was in the Army, and he ended up going AWOL because of meth and staying local until they came and arrested him. But get him out of the car, and I'm like, oh, fuck, I know them. And it's, in particular, her, she gave me a lot of great information in the past, and unfortunately, she was a beautiful girl. She just went down that fucking meth, that glass dick heel if you will that mess shit and then just I'm, I got to watch her over a period of a year just degrade physically and mentally but gets them out orders them over to the car um, put your hands on the car for officer safety we're going to pat for rescue pat for us gum and then he uses my lines do uh, you have anything illegal in the vehicle no we don't have anything the guy says and he said, well, you don't mind if I search? And they, they kind of him hauled around. And I was like, hey. Then the girl knew who I was. I was like, hey, do we have to get a fucking search warrant? I mean, I know y'all's history. You know me. And they were like, no, well, if, you know, he can go ahead and search. And it was a smaller car. <laughs> and he, he goes up to search. And he gets in the driver's side door. And he starts digging through the car. And the guy's like, he said, Wolf, Wolf. I said, what, man? He said, well, you might want to tell him not to do that. I said, what are you talking about? He said, we were fucking. And obviously, they were tweaking, too. They're, the eyes of pupils were dilating and everything else. I said, well, fuck. He, yeah, I said, he's looking for the dope. Save us some time. If you got some dope or whatever, we can work something out. I need some information, blah, blah. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. He said, right when y'all pulled up, 
she was giving me a blowjob, and he said, I just had the biggest nut I've ever had in my entire life. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, y'all pulled up, he turned on the lights, and I nutted. I'm sorry to say that, y'all, that's what he said. I nutted at the same time. He said, I blew the biggest load I've ever blown in my entire life, and it blew all over the roof of the car. He said, your guy's in there. Now, my guy's been over. He's got a ball cap on, but he's been over, and he's digging all through the center compartment. He's looking under the seats. I'm like, holy shit. I said, so you're telling me he's going to get basically contaminated with your sperm? He's like, yes, I'm telling you. I'm telling you that as a professional favor. I said, well, fuck it. It's too late now. He's searching the car. So he gets done searching the car, and he came back, and he, he had a pipe. And, oh, my God, I'll never forget it. But he was like, oh, I found, I found the pipe. Y'all are under arrest. I said, no, no, no. no. I said, we're going we're gonna to work with him. We'll get some information. And I said, but look, the, you know, I said, let me look at you. And I maybe mean, he was actually taller than me. I said, let me look at you. And he was like, what are you talking about? I said, just let me look at you. And I said, turn around. And he turned around. And y'all, he had sperm, whatever you want to call it, just whatever you want to call it, all down his fucking back. Uh, of his uniform and on the back of his hat. <laughs> I was like, mm. I said, you know what, dude? And we're going we're gonna to throw that glass pipe in the wood, that glass stick in the woods. He was like, what are you talking about? This is a good arrest. I said, just hear me out. I said, throw that motherfucker in the woods. He was like, I said, just do it. So he threw it in the woods. I turned to them. I said, we didn't actually approve that that was a meth pipe, right? And they were like, yeah. And I said, and then tonight, as far as we're concerned, tonight never happened. I said, if I ever fucking hear it from another meth head that one of my guys had your jizz on him, I swear to God, I'll come back and get you. They were like, oh, we're not going to say anything. We're not going to say anything. Um, and then. Meanwhile, my FTO was like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm like, bro, we got to go. And, and he went to get in a car. I said, no, no, no. I said, take your fucking shirt off. He's like, what's wrong? I said, take your hat off. Take your shirt off. Come to the trunk of my car. And and we let them go. And we got back there, and I told him what happened. He was like, motherfucker, fucking shit. I'm going to get their fucking ass. I said, bro, it's not, <laughs> it's not like they... You were in the car and he ran up and blew his load on your back, right? I said, you went, you were doing your job and you didn't know there was stuff all over the ceiling. Evidently, he said it was the biggest in his entire life. You didn't know you got it on you. Um, but he had the red ass. And boy, I had to take him to get another uniform shirt. Um, mm, but of a few jokes, yeah. But I really didn't embarrass him that bad. But some people know about it. And... It is what it is. It goes back to the sex part, right? Oh, God. Give me one more real quick one. Uh, some of the information I used to get from people about the sex parties they would have with the meth and the meth cooks. Some of them we never got, it, um, not because we didn't hunt them, but because they were smart. But the one guy had a beautiful wife. Um, she was a redhead. And he used to tie her up naked in the yard and put her hands above her head. This came from confidential informants that would go to his house when he was cooking and he was way the fuck out in the middle of nowhere and we just never got him. But different people confirmed this to me. He would tie her up naked with her hands above her head and when he was the people would come to buy the dope, he would take the extra 50 bucks and let them have sex with her while she was tied up. And he would just let her let her have meth, and for her, I guess that was her their jam, right? They did it. Um, one of the females that told me that also stayed with them for a little while, and she said he did the same thing to her, but he didn't tie her up. When he would call people and say, hey, I just got done cooking, they would come over, and he, he would only charge them. I don't know why y'all, I'm not trying to be ugly, but you can use your imagination. But she told me, she said he would give... Um, them they would buy their dope they'd sit down to smoke it and he would say 20 more bucks and you can fuck her talk about my CI and then she said they were you know sometimes it'd be 10 a day and he kept the money but she said I got free dope so just a whole different world uh, always sexual and always the firearms and there's a million 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 stories I could tell y'all for that but 
I'm going to conclude this one for today. I hope I wasn't too graphic. Now, the epidemic is heroin, right? So I'm fortunate that I never had to partake in the hunt and shit for that, although I worked many heroin overdoses and stuff as a detective. But that's a, the today, God, those guys that are working the street, they got to carry Narcan with them. They're dealing with like several a day overdoses, which is crazy. So according to my friends that are still in, heroin makes meth look like meth used to make crack look like back in the day. But anyway, this is going to be a short episode, y'all. Um, we just concluded with Mo. Y'all know it was like eight or nine parts or whatever. And we ended it with Jasper Brock. The This episode, end of the month. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. A little bit real life, real crime back to you without it being a series. And I'm going to be starting a two-part series next week on one of the worst sex offenders that I've ever seen or ever known of. It'll be next week or the week after. Two parts only. One, me telling you the story. Two, the defense attorney who actually handled the trial is going to come in and tell you all the, the inside juice. Um, and that'll be Jasper Brock. So that being said, I love and appreciate every one of you. Thank you so much for helping me grow. The podcast awards, I'm sure, are over with by now or the final voting for the public. Thank you for everybody who voted. We love you. Jim Chapman loves you. Local leaders, Real Life Real Crime loves you. Hopefully we'll bring some awards home. It's the only time of year we're going to ask y'all for that. But we thank you for it. It means a lot. In our new podcast, Bloody and Gola, go check it out. The first episode is the history of how Angola came to exist. It's more tame, if you will. The second episode is going to be balls to the wall, hardcore. Don't listen if you don't like to hear bad shit, okay? Um, the first season is going to be eight episodes, and they, each one after the first one is going to be a hell of a story. So go check it out, um, Bloody Angola, anywhere you can listen to a podcast. Download it. Subscribe to it. It's Jim Chapman and I telling you the stories of bloody Angola and Scorch Justice September the 6th the se second season starts y'all if you haven't listened to it go listen to it the the case I did on Jessica Chambers and in Mandy Mingxing show uh, it is an absolute horrible case but the second season will be I think I think the first season is like 10 or 11 or 12 episodes. Second season is going to be Darley Routier's case. The mom who is on death row in Texas for murdering her own boys, even though they only tried her for one. They're about to execute her. I'm going to take you inside that story like you've never seen it before from my perspective. And yes, we have been in direct contact numerous times with Darley. So that's going to be a hell of a show. But thank you all again. Uh, follow me at Real Life Real Crime, um, at Overton Woody, at Scorch Justice, at Bloody Angola. We have all the Facebook pages. We have the Real Life Real Crime community app. Go check it out. It's for free. You don't get censored. I go there every day. Um, all the other good social media stuff y'all I'm supposed to say it is what it is one day I'll get a list but thank y'all for tuning in I appreciate you um, if you are a lifer from Normandy Normandy France and you want to become an organ donor go to lopa.org l-o-p-a dot org take a moment sign up that's the Louisiana Organ Procurement Agency. You do not have to be from the state of Louisiana to sign up. If you are from the state of Louisiana, I urge you to sign up. Y'all, there are people dying every day waiting on these organs from people who have passed. And it's a very small percentage of people 
whoever gift their organs that ever gets used because everything has to be just perfect right right um but i know people who have died waiting on organs but i know a lot of people who are alive today because they received an organ transplant through lopa and that's my jam that's why i always back it up and i love and appreciate each and every one of you i'm woody overton your host of real life real crime the podcast and until next time or ever, don't let me catch you out on Murder by You. Peace. Real Life Real Crime is a true crime podcast brought to you by your host, Woody Overton, executive producer, Jim Chapman with Envision Podcast Studios. Your music is provided by Chase Tyler and the Chase Tyler Band. Follow me on Instagram at Real Life Real Crime or at Overton Woody. Check out our numerous social media pages. Also, go to the app store and download our free Real Life Real Crime community app, which contains all things Real Life Real Crime and true crime and uncensored and run by me. Wherever you listen to a podcast, go like, subscribe, and review to Real Life Real Crime or my other podcast, Scorch Justice. Thank you. The other right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney prior to or during any question. If you can't afford one, the court will appoint one for you. Do you understand your rights? <laughs>